Dear church family gathered, I invite you to pray with me. Let's ask God to bless the preaching of his word. Heavenly Father, you are worthy of all our praise. Help us in these moments to bring our hearts to you. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends, good to see you once again. Welcome, everyone. And uh, I do believe that life is filled with misunderstandings. I'll give you an example. Uh, this past week, a news uh, story came out uh, fi- pi- picturing uh, this, this, this picture. Uh, some of you uh, may have heard what this picture is. It is uh, it's a black hole, but upon further investigation, what it actually turned out to be is a donut. Is a donut, and sorry for a very bad joke this morning. God likes donuts, too. There are misunderstandings in life. Uh, there are misunderstandings with people. Uh, for example, I remember my brother um, going to a florist, and at this point, uh, he had been married for at least 10 years. He had fathered four children. And as he picked up a corsage for Mother's Day, they asked who he was taking to prom. Yeah, misunderstandings. I remember going uh, to New Lenox, and our family was playing in the park. This was years ago. And uh, as, as the children were there and I was there, someone asked me who the babysitter was. Happened to be my wife. Um, and uh, so we misunderstand people, don't we? You ever been there? You ever assume someone was related when they were not? Married when they were not? This is the worst. Pregnant when they were not? Open mouth and insert foot, right? Uh, there are misunderstandings when it comes to food. Uh, for example, does anyone know uh, what this sandwich is? Anyone ever eaten one of these sandwiches? Yeah, this is uh, what I grew up, they called it tiger meat. Um, some of them call it a cannibal sandwich. It is actually raw ground beef. And if it's the first time that you've been served it, you might wonder, you know, um, shouldn't you cook it first? Uh, send it back. I, I didn't ask for rare, I asked for medium well. Thank you very much. Uh, misunderstanding can happen with these sandwiches if you've never had them. They're good, by the way. Um, uh, misunderstanding for me happened uh, with this common meal. Um, these are baked beans, and let me ask you, do you serve them hot or cold? Hot, right? So when I'm at a family function and I dig in uh, with my spoon and I have a cold mouthful of baked beans, man, I'm misunderstanding how these should be served. This is, this is bad. I'm going to ask, where am I going with this? How good it is to gather in this place, isn't it? So much as we see Jesus, our Savior, so much hope, so much perspective. But one of the things I recognize is that we live in a world of spiritual misunderstandings. Would you agree? In fact, that's why in May we're starting an apologetics class. And and what that is is just learning how to defend the faith and answer some of the misunderstandings that are out there. Uh, People have misunderstandings about how we all came to be and the origins of this world. There are misunderstandings about other religions. Are they all the same? What's the difference? And perhaps one of the greatest misunderstandings that still exists is with this question, which is, who is Jesus? Maybe you've wondered that. Maybe you've had friends ask you. There's some people who think, well, maybe Jesus is just like Gandhi. He's a good guy, a social reformer. Maybe he's like Ben Franklin, just a a wise man who had a lot of good things to say. But who is Jesus? You know, during his earthly ministry, the disciples were wondering the very same thing. And some people said he was the prophet Elijah or Jeremiah. Some thought he was John the Baptist. And when Jesus asked Peter this question, look at his answer. Peter answered, you know who you are? You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You know, that's what we proclaim here at Amazing Love as well. When it comes to Jesus, he's not just a good man, great teacher. He's a Savior of the world, the only one who could forgive the sins of the world. The reason we have hope and joy and peace because of who Jesus is. Well, this is Palm Sunday. And on this day, we're going to celebrate as Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a colt and, and, and celebrated with palm branches and cloaks. But what I recognize on Palm Sunday is that there was a great misunderstanding, bigger than the black hole to a donut. The great misunderstanding was who Jesus was and what he had actually come to do, which we'll investigate today. But I still wonder for people today, Do you think there exists in the dichotomy a a, a difference between what people want God to do and be and who he actually is and what he promised to be? Or making it more personal, have you ever wished God was something he weren't, gave you something he didn't promise versus being who he actually said he was and doing what he actually promised you he would do? That's why this is so relevant. So welcome. 
Uh, we're in this series called Love Like Jesus, and we're going to see that Jesus knew how to love people even though he was misunderstood that first Palm Sunday. We're going to get into the lesson now, and then we're going to pick it apart. So I invite you to follow along with me. It's either in the worship folder or on the screen before you. Here we go. Here's the lesson. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So the word. And here we have the greatest celebration of Jesus. A celebration that will culminate for all eternity when every knee shall bow before the King of Kings. And as we dig in, can you do me a favor and turn to the person next to you? Tell them, don't let the rocks do your job. Don't let the rocks do your job. Praise God, praise Him now and forever. You ready to have fun in the Word of God? Is that okay? Let's dig in a little bit. Um, I know you've come here for encouragement. That's why we come to church, and, um, and I want to refresh you. And so I thought I'd bring up a really encouraging topic, uh, which is uh, tax day, right? Um, uh, probably you've filed your taxes by this point. I hope so anyway. But I was just curious, has anyone ever had to amend their taxes? Amend taxes. Anyone? Uh, this was the first year in however many years I've been filing that I've had to amend my taxes, I received a wrong government form that was later corrected. I filed early March. They sent it late in March. And um, I don't know, but I had one of my less than stellar moments. For as I got this form from the government after their mistake, there was this part of me that says, why should I? After all, this wasn't my mistake. I have filed through TurboTax, done my job. Why should I? Which was followed by wondering what the consequences were. Like, can they put you in jail for not amending your taxes? And then I was seeing the Chicago Tribune post about Pastor Bloomer in jail, didn't amend taxes. So I amended my taxes. But I had a less than stellar moment. And I wonder, have you ever had that experience, maybe with yourself or with a child? Uh, you're, you're told what to do, you know what you have to do, but you have this, this feeling inside of you that doesn't want to do it. And so children, they sometimes don't say, you know, why should I? They say, do I have to? And for a while, if you have children under the age of 10, because I said so is enough. Parents, it's all you need. You don't need to debate with them, right? Because I said so. Do it. Right. And, and even as, as, as adults, we, we sometimes have that feeling. In fact, what we understand about the, the, the spiritual nature given us is that it's sinful. And so often we'll have this idea, why should I? Do I have to? It's questions we might ask when it comes to giving, Right? We're not afraid about talking about money in the church. After all, God wants our heart, not our checkbook or our wallet. But sometimes we might ask the question, well, why should I? Why should I give first fruit offerings and strive for 10%? Do I have to? When it comes to the gift of sex, which isn't dirty, which isn't bad. God actually created it. It was his idea. We might ask, why do I have to reserve it for marriage? Do I really have to? Or, or maybe we do that when it comes to a lot of our Christian walk, whether it be giving or serving, maybe even honoring authorities. Do I have to? Well, the reason I bring this up is because on the first Palm Sunday, the disciples were given a job. They, they were told to go to a stranger's house they never met and untie a colt and bring it to Jesus. And I was wondering if at any of their experience they were wondering, do I have to? Like, why should I? And here's what I believe. They didn't understand the significance of this moment. They didn't see what God saw. See, for them to do this, they were actually going to fulfill a prophecy. The prophet Zechariah, 
uh, he said in this, uh, Zechariah 9, verse 9 said, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. What God knew is that they were going to fulfill prophecy. But they probably didn't know. And so they're probably wondering, well, do I have to? But here's the first point that we learned from Palm Sunday. When, when we might misunderstand God's clear will, the point is this. We don't need to know the why to do God's will. We don't need to know. We don't have to see how it works out on the other side. Once we have the clear command of God, that's what we should go and do. No questions asked because he said so. But if you've grown up and if you can relate to me, the older we get, the harder we have a time doing this. We rationalize ourselves out of doing God's will. We, we rationalize when it comes to the gift of sex. We might say, well, everyone knows you've got to try it before you buy it. We rationalize not giving or not serving. We, we use a when-then mentality. When I get there, then I can do that. But in the meantime, that's just not possible. We rationalize. Everyone else is doing that or not doing that, and so why do I have to? We see how much we struggle with our sinful nature. It's one of the reasons that God praised the childlike faith. In fact, God used children as an illustration. In, in one of the accounts of his ministry, he said he, he called little children to him and placed children among them and said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like one of these little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. Because what do children do? They trust mom and dad. You said it. That's enough. And then I consider our Savior Jesus. He's riding in on Sunday, knowing he will die on Friday. Does he have any logical excuses why he shouldn't go? I think he has a ton. Why do I have to suffer the penalty of sin when I am the sinless Son of God? Why do we have to save mankind when, Father, we were good without them and, and we're not needy, we're self-sufficient? Why do we have to clean up a mess we didn't create? Why can't we just start anew with new people in a new world? He could have had a ton of logical excuses. But there's only one reason that led him to do what he did. And that reason was enough. It's the reason that we've gathered. That reason is love. See, Jesus, no matter what was going in his mind, had this crazy, this undying love for you and I a love that would lead him to give his life so that you and I could be forgiven for any and all sin. A love that would push past, endure so much so that we could be saved through his blood shed on the cross and redeemed we are because of that love. And what he teaches us this, past, this Palm Sunday is this, that love compels us past our logical excuses. Love compelled him and it's the reason we do what we do. In fact, it reminds me of a conversation I had with one of my buddies growing up. Uh, one of my buddy's moms growing up played the organ for her church. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen an organ player, but what they do is just crazy. Um, they got like, you know, three things, four things sometimes going at the same time. It takes a ton of practice to play the organ, right? And uh, my buddy would say that every time that his mom would play, she would get sick to her stomach and she'd just be terrified. And so she would practice and practice and practice. And he wasn't sure how enjoyable it was, but she would do it. And why? Because she loved Jesus. Yeah, she got sick. Yeah, she was terrified. But love compelled her. You know, it's what I see in this congregation. I met some amazing people who come to leadership team meetings, who serve and volunteer, who give and give. And, and we might have all these logical reasons why not to. But we only need one reason why to continue, and that is love. You know, next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and uh, this church is, is built upon one core value called inviting. And, and we know how scary it can be to invite those who, you know, are new to church or are friends. And, and the logical excuses we might use, well, it might get awkward, or they might say no, or uh, I might even lose a friendship by, by putting myself out there. We have all these reasons that could stop us, but we really only need one reason to do it. Because we love them. We want them to know God's love. Because there's no ce better celebration than Easter Sunday of a, a risen, victorious Savior who shares that victory with all 
people. So love compels us. And I've seen it in you. Love has compelled so many in this church to continue to serve and give. Thank you so much. So we might misunderstand God's clear will, but what's also true, I believe, is that as we do God's will, sometimes we're misunderstood by other people. Uh, so the disciples, they go regardless of what they know about what they're doing. And, and, and look what happens. Um, the verses go on and say, um, as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. Now, if you were on the other end and you were seeing your colt being taken away by strangers, would that be sufficient for you? Like, can I go to your garage and take your car? Can you give me the keys, please? The Lord needs it. W would you be okay with that? In fact, it reminds me, there's a, a Star Wars convention going on, and there's this, this part of Star Wars where, where he uses the force and says, these are not the droids you're looking for. And, and if there was a Bible passage that correlates, I mean, this is, the Lord needs it, the force. So I, I think there's a great potential, and I'm not sure, you know, maybe God used his force to make him understand. I don't know. But I think there's great potential that others misunderstood their activity. And I think sometimes people will misunderstand the activity of other Christians. Because we're not called just to release a cult. We are called to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. To be many representatives, many representatives of Jesus here on earth. I consider the, I guess, difference of that calling. The way I looked at it this past week is it's, it's kind of like a boxer who's training for a fight. And for me, I love the Rocky movies. I grew up on them and also the Creed movies that are out there. Anyone see those movies, fans? And for me, when I, when I watch those movies, the best parts are the training parts. And so I watch Creed 2 and seeing Adonis Creed and just pounding sand. And maybe you should go out and do that because that's how you get strong. I don't know. But anyway, um, training in the desert. I loved Rocky 4, which is the best of the Rockies, right? Where he's in Russia and he's climbing up the snowy mountain and he's doing pull-ups on a log and he's lifting a cart of stones and that's what you do to get ready to fight Drago, right? And, and then I consider the strict training that they have for their diet. Famously, Rocky would drink raw eggs, which I could never do and I still don't want to try, but that's what you do when you're training, right? You got to be serious about it. Because what I know is that if a fight is coming and you're eating donuts and you're laying on the couch, you're going to get pounded and you're going to lose the fight. Well, well, here's the reason that this matters. Do you know if you're a Christ follower, you're in a fight every day that you live? There's a spiritual adversary who wants to get you down, who is tough, who is a roaring lion. And if you're not prepared for that, you could get knocked out. In, in fact, another takeaway is this, that I believe an uncommon calling, like being the light of the world, a Christ follower, will lead to uncommon activity. In fact, some people, they might look at our priorities and say, man, you used to be fun. What happened? Th they might scratch their heads. Why do you do that? And where are you going now? And you've been to church how many times during the week? What? But that's okay. Because we have an uncommon calling. In fact, uh, Paul, he said, you know, if you're a Christ follower, you are like this boxer. You are in strict training. Paul said this, he said, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. He said, Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it a slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. You and I are in strict training. I wonder this morning, is there any uncommon activity God is calling you to? And maybe it's not, not even something sinful. We know we should keep away from sin, but, but something that the world says is common that just isn't helpful for the strict battle that you're in. May the Spirit give you discernment on how you can be better prepared in the ring every day that you live. And may He empower you to do just that. But now we look to Jesus. And Jesus rides in on Palm Sunday. And in my personal Bible study, I'm reading about Revelation, and I can't wait to be in heaven and, and hear the glory and the praises that last eternally. I need to remind you about heaven. It's a place where there's no more pain or sadness, uh, where all the, the, the sinful things have been taken away and removed. But here's the picture of heaven on earth as they praise the King of kings and Lord of lords. 
And while they erupt in praise with palm branches and coats, they praise him for all the wrong reasons. There's a great misunderstanding. In fact, verse 37 calls this out. In verse 37 it says, When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Not that he is Savior of the world, not that he is King of kings, Lord of lords, but the miracles. Let me teach just a little bit. It was just days earlier that he had one of his greatest miracles, the raising of a man named Lazarus. Lazarus was a friend and had been dead in the tomb for four days. And when Jesus, he arrives to the morning of death, he changes it into a celebration of life through three simple words, Lazarus, come out. And a man who had been dead four days comes out of the tomb, unwraps the clothes, says, hey, what's up? And the people who saw this, they reacted and they said, man, if Jesus can do that, surely he can throw off the Caesar. Surely he can throw off the oppression of Rome. In fact, this isn't the first time that they thought they would make Jesus an earthly king. It was after the feeding of the 5,000 that Jesus actually had to go away. John records and says, Jesus, knowing they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. They wanted an earthly king. They wanted a Jesus who'd make their lives better. Make my 70 or 80 years utopia here on earth. Help me with that. But they didn't recognize him for who he was. Jesus is not riding in on a stallion with a sword. He's riding in on a donkey with a message. And so Jesus is not an earthly king, but a spiritual king. And so we learn. I was trying to think of a modern day example of how much they misunderstood Jesus. And I'm not sure if I like this one, but it's my attempt at uh, setting up the dichotomy. Let's say you have a, uh, a boy who is turning 18 and uh, it's his entry into adulthood. And instead of getting a cake and, and singing happy birthday, instead you have balloons for the 50th anniversary for a, a kid who's turning 18. That'd be weird. I'd wonder his expression. But the love of Jesus, he's misunderstood and he's praised for all the right, wrong reasons. But he comes anyway. He doesn't call off the party. He doesn't tell him to be silent. He comes knowing that all these voices yelling Hosanna will be the same voices yelling crucify when he loses his power and his prestige. And so do we learn about the love of Jesus. Well, that to love through misunderstanding takes an incredible amount of patience. He bears with. He puts up. He understands that they might have misguided hearts and yet he still loves them and he still goes Jesus fulfills the words of our first lesson where Paul said, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, and humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if anyone has a grievance against someone. This is Jesus. So how do we love like Jesus? Have you misunderstood someone? Maybe right now you didn't get the situation to read correct. Maybe someone has misunderstood you. God says, be patient. Give another chance. Slowly let it unravel as you love them. But I think more than putting ourselves in the shoes of Jesus, it's probably more important to put ourselves in the shoes of the crowd. Because I believe we're no less tempted to make God the God who will help our earthly lives be better. We might approach God saying, God, if I hand over my finances, if I hand over my marriage, if I hand over my job, and if you make that all better... Well, then I'll trust you with more. But he, again, is not the earthly king. He is a spiritual king. And the truth of the matter is he could fix all of our problems as easily as he called out Lazarus, come out of the tomb. But he hasn't come to make earthly lives better, but to win lost souls. And so the question on Palm Sunday really is this. What we're left with is this. Will you praise him and trust him when things don't go your way? or turn out as you expect. See, the crowd on Palm Sunday, they didn't expect that this king of glory who raised Lazarus from death would die. They, they didn't expect that, and so they went away disappointed. 
And sometimes we also don't expect that the Almighty God can allow this or that to happen in our lives, and we might go away disenfranchised and confused. Will you still praise Him? You know, the, a, a great example of modern-day praise is Virginia's coach, Tony Bennett. I don't know how many of you watched March Madness. Uh, they actually won the national championship this week. There is Tony Bennett. Um, but it was only a year ago that he had one of the worst games, one of the worst defeats in March Madness history. Uh, some of you may know he was the number one seed with Virginia who fell to a 16 seed, UMBC. But if you go back to that day when they, they lost, he still was considering God, still had faith in God. His speech at that point was this, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. That's a, a rephrasing of a psalm. He didn't lose faith. In fact, before the Virginia game, he played Torrin Wells' Hills and Valleys song saying, we can trust God, he's with us, whether it be defeat, whether it be victory, it doesn't matter. He's a picture of praise no matter the circumstances. And so for us, the God we've come to worship is worthy of praise for who he is and what he has done because of his unfailing love, because he has forgiven our sins, because he has promised eternal life with him. And this is the point. May we love Jesus through praise when we misunderstand what he's doing, when we're in a circumstance that doesn't feel good or pleasant, when it's a hill or a valley. Let us praise the King of kings and Lord of lords, for he is worthy. And may God empower us to do that. Amen. Please stand.